All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Comp 3430 Operating Systems. Today is our last class. Hooray. Yeah, hooray. It's the last class. Hooray. Uh, oh, no, I forgot to update the date. It's because I have the wrong slides open. Well, that would have been crazy. Crazy. Crazy is the wrong word to describe that. That would have been just embarrassing. It wouldn't have been crazy at all. There. June 15th, 2023, hooray. Yes, we're here. We've made it to the end of this course. Um, there's a couple things that I want to talk about before I get to content today. And the main thing that I want to talk about before I get to content today is that I posted this document up to today's uh, section again. This is the learning outcomes document that I had talked about previously. Uh, but I've made one change to it. I made a bunch of changes to it. I changed a bunch of lines in this file, but what I have republished is, I'm gonna go down to the bottom here. These are the learning outcomes that you will see on the final exam. These are the things that you will be assessed on in the final exam. Uh, I want to, to try and reduce the surface area that you've got for the final exam on Tuesday. Uh, so unsurprisingly, the, a lot of the learning outcomes from the second half of the course are going to be on the final exam. Um, I did make one change here to this log structured end. I've just stricken the log structured part, uh, and it's just journaling file systems. Uh, uh, one like this here, this is just not being assessed at all this term. That's how you can interpret that statement, is that there's, it's not marked in the final, it doesn't have an X beside it, it's not going to be assessed at all uh, on any, any assessment this term. Uh, I'm going to go up to the top here. Uh, I put this section back, but I just cross everything out. So again, it's, it's not on the final, you don't have to worry about it. The things from the beginning of the course that I'm going to ask you questions about are from uh, week two threads. And I've written final sort of on identify the critical sections requiring mutually exclusive access to a piece of code that we run concurrently using threads or processes. I've written sort of there because I'm asking you a question about the idea of concurrency, but I'm not giving you code related to that. I'm kind of saying like, this is the hypothetical code that would be running. These are the things that can happen when this code is running or more appropriately, you will tell me about the things that will happen when this code is running. Uh, and then you will be given an opportunity to tell me about the kinds of issues that can come up with the concurrent execution of this code. Uh, the other thing that I've got here is um, compare and contrast different scheduling policies, describe a scheduling algorithm used by a modern operating system. Uh, this is really specifically, this is really specifically MLFQ. This is very specifically MLFQ. When I say compare and contrast different scheduling policies here, I am not, I'm not going to ask you to apply a scheduling policy to a workload. That is not the question that I'm asking you. I'm not saying here's the tasks, please schedule them using these policies. That is not what I'm doing for the final exam. I'm asking you to compare and contrast them based on general behavior. So what they do, uh, what the policies are, and how they behave under certain circumstances. How they behave under certain circumstances. Are there any questions about that? Okay, okay. Uh, the rest of it here is, I mean, it's week four plus, and a lot of this is just like stuff that we've been doing. There are some things that you can safely ignore, like I'm not gonna ask you to write C code to write a file system. I'm not gonna ask you write to, write to write C code to write or to read a file system. I'm not gonna ask you to identify identify inconsistencies in a file system. So I'm not gonna be like, here's a file system, tell me what's inconsistent about it. You still are going to need to be able to tell me about how file systems can become inconsistent, but I'm not asking you like, look, here's a file system that's maybe inconsistent, tell me if it is or isn't. I'm definitely not gonna ask you to repair an inconsistent file system. Um, and the rest of it is, is kind of fair game here. Uh, I'll come back to this later if we've got time, um, but 
just to give you a heads up that this document exists and this is what you can focus your efforts on when you're preparing for, for the final exam on Tuesday next week. Are there any questions about it before I get on with, with the rest of the stuff today? Okay, okay, cool. So this is up under today's uh, lecture section. You can find it on the course web page. Okay, so by the end of today's lecture, what I am hoping for you to be able to do is, I want you to be able to explain how paging solves the problems introduced with segmentation. So the main problem that we introduced when we were talking about segmentation as a free space management issue and a virtual memory implementation was segmentation fixes internal fragmentation and introduces external fragmentation, keeping track of what space is free and then trying to find spaces that are big enough to fit segments is a big problem. It's a bit of a pain to find those things. Paging solves that problem by breaking memory up into fixed size chunks. So kind of using the same solution that we've seen in file systems, just break it up into fixed size chunks then we are either having free pages or no free pages. That's the only question that we have to ask. We just have to find something that's free or not free. I want you to be able to compare and contrast methods for address translation. So I'm going to go through the exercise of us comparing um, segmentation. Segmentation uh, and uh, base and bounds or segmentation and paging, um, but you should be able to compare and contrast all three of them with each other. So base and bounds, segmentation and paging. And I want you to be able to compare and contrast the solution of multi-level page tables or page directories with file system implementations. So I keep saying this, hey, this sure sounds a lot like a file system. This sure sounds a lot like a file system. And I really want us to be able to just make those connections. What exactly about virtual memory looks like a file system and how does it look like a file system? One thing I wanted to bring up about segmentation before um, we got into it was about a question that was asked by a person that's not here today and that's okay. Hopefully they'll hear the answer to this question after they watch the video, after they watch the video. There was this idea of two different kinds of segmentation, uh, two different ways to approach translating addresses with segmentation, this idea of explicit versus implicit uh, translations. Explicit segmentation is segmentation based on address prefixes, which is what we did in class. That was the exercise we went through where the first two bits of this correspond to which segment this is. We use those two bits to decide which segment we're going to be looking at in uh, physical memory. Implicit segmentation is basing segmentation and address translation on the context of what we were doing the address translation for in the first place. So that means that the hardware, our MMU, is going to use the source of the translation, why it was doing the translation in the first place, to decide which segment it's in. So I'm going to pop back over to my diagram here that we were looking at uh, yesterday. And implicit segmentation, so explicit segmentation is this whole idea. We've got these segments that have prefixes, and the prefixes are what are used to determine which segment it's in. Implicit segmentation is going to be the the reason that I, the MMU, am currently doing this translation in the first place is because I am trying to fetch the next instruction. The only reason I would ever fetch the next instruction or the only place I should fetch the next instruction from is the code segment. Therefore, this translation goes to the code segment. I'm doing an address translation that's like a move instruction. So I fetched the instruction. I've started to decode it. The move instruction is trying to load something from memory, from the heap. It's part of the instruction, so I have to translate that virtual address into a physical address. I know that I'm translating something that's in the heap because it's pulling it from an instruction. It's part of an instruction that's being used for a, for a move or a load operation. Implicit is I know why I'm generating this address or why I'm translating this address. 
I'm going to use that information to decide which segment I'm going to use uh, that address translation for. Explicit is using the prefix of the address. Explicit is the only one that I really care about. Explicit is the only one that I care about. All right, so paging. Base and bounds, we've got this problem of internal fragmentation. We're separating physical address space. We're allocating full virtual address spaces. Segmentation, we're separating our virtual address space up into chunks, and then we're allocating in physical memory only as much as is necessary. Paging is, let's separate both virtual and physical memory into the same fixed size chunks. And the purpose of that is, I want to minimize internal fragmentation, so I don't want uh, to have allocated but otherwise unusable space. I'm going to minimize that. It still happens. We're going to have pages that are allocated where we're not using the whole page, but the amount that's wasted is only up to the page size as opposed to the entire chunk that's in the middle of this virtual address space. And we have eliminated external fragmentation. So we can't have external fragmentation because we only have the choice of is there a page available or is there not a page available? And that's it. There will either be one for us to use or one that we can't use. Let's have a quiz. Fifty-five percent, really? If that's what I, don't, I don't know. If that's the way it was set at the beginning of the term. <laughs> Sorry. Does that mean it's too high or too low? Too low. <laughs> Hundred percent final. Okay, I'll give you two more seconds to join. All right. So we're talking here about segmentation and paging. So with base and bounds and segmentation, the move that we made there was segment sizes are too big. Well, we, we didn't really have segment sizes with base and bounds, but we definitely had internal fragmentation with base and bounds. Segmentation in and of itself can suffer from internal fragmentation but only a little bit, only a little bit, only a little bit. We're only allocating as much as is necessary to hold the segment right now. If we've got a heap, we might be allocating a little bit more than necessary so that we don't constantly have to call that BRK system call, but we're only going to suffer from a tiny little bit of internal fragmentation. Fixed size segments are not very flexible. Segmentation, while those fixed size chunks in our virtual address spaces are fixed in size, they're flexible enough. They're flexible enough for what we need to accomplish with what we're doing with segmentation. Segmentation fault is an excellent answer. Dynamically sized segments and external 
fragmentation. These two things are kind of the same problem, that we have segments in physical memory where we've allocated only as much as is necessary leads to external fragmentation. We've got these varying size chunks that we've allocated in physical memory, and those varying size chunks mean that we have varying size spaces in between those varying size chunks. Sometimes they're big enough, sometimes they're not big enough for what we're trying to allocate. Is that okay? Okay. All right. So basic paging here is linear paging. This is what we were just looking at. is approximately equal to segments, so they have the same problems. You know, we can kind of conceptually say that paging and segments are they're similar to each other in that they're both breaking apart something into the same size. Segmentation is breaking up our virtual address space into same size things. But with physical memory, once we move to physical memory and we've only allocated as much as is necessary for these segments, We've now di diverged from what paging is doing. Paging is fixing the size of page frames in physical memory, as well as fixing the size of pages in virtual memory, whereas segmentation only fixes the size in virtual memory. What it gets out, what gets allocated in physical memory, kind of depends on um, what is actually being used by that segment. Paging is complicated to implement and uses too much memory. Paging is complicated to implement. It definitely is. Your hardware has to have like a lot of support and a lot of hardware to support the idea of being able to deal with a page table. That's true, but for us on the other side of hardware, we don't care too much about that. Paging is slow and takes up to memory. That's the best answer here. That's the best answer here. Paging is slow because in order for our processor, our hardware to even start doing a translation, it has to go to memory. It has to read the page table entry from memory. So to start doing a translation, our our operating system, us, we will switch a process on. We're going to say, hey, this is where in memory our page table based directory, this is register, this is where in memory our page table lives. Our hardware is going to say, okay, this is the address I'm trying to translate. I need to go to this page table that's in memory, find the page table entry, that's one memory access, that tells me where in physical memory this virtual address is. And now I need to go back to physical memory again to fetch that actual thing. So for every one program counter uh, fetch instruction, we've got to do at least two memory accesses to get to the point of being able to do the translation. It takes up too much memory because when we've got pages, we're breaking up our virtual address space into pages. We have to have a translation for every page with a linear page table, even if the page is not used. We have to have an entry for that thing. So the size of a page table for a process is going to be the size of virtual address space divided by how many pages there are, the page size that we've got. We have to have an entry for every one of those things. When we talk about using like 56 bits for addressing, we're talking about like hundreds of megabytes per process for just page tables and, and nothing else. So paging is slow and, and takes up too much memory. All right.
<laughs> Did you hit the button too fast? Oh. Okay, so yes, paging can suffer from internal fragmentation. It's just a tiny bit. It's just a tiny bit, but it can suffer from internal fragmentation. We may allocate a page and we may not use the whole page. With file systems, we may allocate a cluster, but not use the whole cluster. With file systems, we may allocate a block, but not use the whole block. We can suffer from internal fragmentation. Okay, good. Paging cannot suffer from an external fragmentation at all. So where it can suffer a, a little bit from internal fragmentation, it's not possible for it to suffer from ex external fragmentation because everything is the same size. We will either be able to find something or we will not be able to find something. We can't move things around and then find some free space. It's either there or it's not there and we can use it or we can't use it. Brett is holding on to the top here. Okay, the last question, I kind of need to show you something because I want to prime you for it before we get to the point of actually looking at the question. I'm going to describe to you what some pictures mean before I show you what the question is. So these were the pictures that I asked you to just ignore last class, and we're not going to ignore them today. Here's the first picture I'm going to show you. I'm not going to really tell you about this other than to say that it's a turtle on the left side and it's like a bookstore on the right side that just has lots and lots and lots of books in it. That's all I'm going to tell you about this picture. Also, it has the word page tables written on the bottom. Uh, I'm not sh I'm really not sure. I, I'm at this stage of being almost an old person and still not quite an old person where I have experienced some things that some people that were born after 2000 just didn't ever do. Do you know what these are? Yes, yeah, these are index cards in a library. So when I was a kid, when I was a kid, again, getting to be an old person now, when I was a kid and I went to the library, we didn't actually have computers. They, they, I mean, yes, there were computers. Computers existed at the time, but they didn't have computers in the library. We would go to the library, and if we wanted to find a title, if we knew what the title of the book was or what the author of the book was, there would be this entire set of drawers that we would go to, and they'd have labels like this on the front of them, that would be like, these are the titles L to B here. I, I don't know why it's like that. These are not English. They're not English. The picture is not English. That's why I've got this weird order. But it would tell us, like, this is approximately the range of things that you can find here. And then once we do that, we'd look at the big drawer set. We'd find approximately the thing that we were looking for. We'd pull open the drawer, and then we'd start going through the index cards to find the actual thing that we were looking for. And that would tell us what the Dewey Decimal number was, and then we could go around the library and look at all the bookshelves and find where the book was. That part you still do. You look up on the computer, where is this? And I guess the Defoe library at least tells you like what floor and aisle number and stuff it is now. But you still have to look for those Dewey Decimal numbers that are at the bottom. So that's what this picture is. This picture is a notepad. It is what it says on the box. This is a small piece of paper that you can quickly pull out and write stuff on and then look at to see what you need very quickly, but it's very limited in space. You don't have a lot of space to write on this thing. It's just a tiny little bit of space. This is a turtle trike. It is what it says in the box. That's Leonardo. And uh, 
Turtle trikes go fast. That's all I need to say about that. They move fast. I'm really looking forward to that Turtles movie, by the way, for partly for nostalgia's sake, but also just because it looks like it'll be a good movie. There's what? There's a new game for it too? Gosh. This is uh, Turtle Money. This is also Leonardo. This is just what it says in the box. This is cash, cash money. Those are the pictures. Do you have any questions about the pictures? Yes? Did I make this turtle money photo? No, I found it online. I'm not that skilled of an artist, unfortunately. Uh, however, one year I did actually print this out and give it to people. Sorry, I didn't print it out before I came to class. Because I can't figure out how to get my stupid laptop to print in color. I'm digressing. Those are the pictures. Those are the pictures. Here's the question. I was gonna say there's no wrong answer here, but there are there are definitely wrong answers here. <laughs> Is it not working? Oh no! I'm really disappointed that didn't work out. Did it time everyone out? Ah. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty. <laughs> All right. If a linear page table is a turtle, it is slow. We have to do two memory accesses for every load, for every instruction load, and stacks and stacks of books. We've got main memory there. We've got physical memory that we're trying to find stuff in. If it's a page table, if it's a turtle in stacks and stacks of books, then a page directory or a multi-level page table to me is, is this. This is us being able to quickly find a book that we need without having to go through the stacks looking for this book that we need. This picture to me, this was outside of the readings that we did, but this picture to me is the translation look aside buffer. There's a tiny piece of memory that fits on your processor that's a little bit separated from the cache part where it just keeps translations. It keeps previously run translations very close to the processor so that it has to do the same translation again. And when you think about this, you've got a, a loop, you know, statement, 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 back to the top. Statement, 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 back to the top. Statement, 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 back to the top. You're just constantly refetching the same instructions over and over again. So for it to keep that translation in this tiny memory, there's a little piece of paper that it can write on. There's not much space, but it can write on it and it can quickly look it up. It makes sense to do that. The turtle trike and the turtle money, oh, those were red herrings. I just wanted to put pictures of the Ninja Turtles up on a, on a slide. Are there any questions about that? I'm never gonna ask a question like this on an exam. Don't, don't worry about that. I'm not going to ask it like this. I won't ask it like this with these weird pictures. I'm really disappointed that that, that, that timed out. I'm sorry. All right, drum roll. It's Brett. Congratulations, Brett. Did you get the answer right, Brett? Oh. <laughs> okay. So paging is fine, but it's avoiding this external fragmentation idea. It suffers a little bit from internal fragmentation, but it does suffer from speed and size issues. The speed issues are addressed with that translation look aside buffer, that cache. Again, if you want to know more about this, take Comp 3370 when you get the chance to take Comp 3370. 
the size issues can be addressed with different data structures. And these are called multi-level page tables or page directories. I'm gonna talk about this in a different context, in a slightly different context. Before I do that, I wanna go through the process of what we did last class with segmentation and base and bounds with translating the address from the virtual address to the physical address, but with paging. I wanna do that to make sure that we can translate addresses with all three approaches that we've got right now. So let's take a look here at, uh, at the diagram that I've got. I've tried to re reproduce something that's approximately the same as what we had with segmentation and uh, paging, but this time what, we're, uh, segmentation and base and bounds, but this time what we're looking at is um, paging specifically. And this is really specifically a linear page table. The approach that we're gonna go through here for translating from a virtual address to a physical address is approximately the same with page directories and multi-level page tables. There's just a level of indirection. So you have to go through two layers to get to the translation before you can get to it, whereas this is just going through one layer of a translation. So our virtual address space here is now broken apart into four chunks. We've got four page entries, four virtual pages in our address space. The virtual pages that we've got in our address space are going to be separated kind of in the same way as segmentation was. The very first page are all the addresses that start with zeros, just zero, zero. The second page are going to be those that start with zero, one. The third page are those that start with one, zero. And the fourth page are those that start with, with one, one. So our virtual addresses are separated in the same way that we were doing with segmentation. The difference now is that we're not separating these contents of our virtual address space into those pages. We don't actually care anymore about the code being at the top. We don't care about the heap coming after that. We don't care about the stack at the bottom. We're not placing code, heap, and stack in any place. That's just happened to be where they are. That just happens to be where they are with paging. In this example here, we've got this page separator that's right in the middle of the heap. It does not matter. We don't care that the heap is there anymore. We're just breaking our virtual address space up completely, just by addresses. The pages that start, uh, the page that starts with the zero zero address, we're going to say is page number zero. The pages that start, the page that starts with one is one, two, and three. So we're going to number our pages here. We still have a code segment. So when we've got those ELF files, we still have like, this is the code segment. You should load it into this virtual address. This is approximately where the heap should go. This is where the stack should go. They will still be loaded into those virtual addresses. But we, we at this point, as hardware and operating system, don't care. We don't care about those things. In the operating system side, we are going to have in addition to all the other stuff that's in the process control block, we will now have a linear page table. The linear page table has two parts here. We've got virtual addresses. These are all of the virtual addresses that start with 00, 01, 10, 11. These are our virtual page numbers. So VPN here, virtual page number. And we've got the mapping to the physical frame number, PFN physical frame number. So pages in our virtual address space are stuffed into physical frames in physical memory. The state that we're in right now is that this process has been loaded. Page number zero 
has been put into physical frame C, page number one is put into physical frame seven, page number three is put into physical frame one, page number two has not been allocated. So we haven't allocated that page at all for this process. It hasn't grown its stack enough or it hasn't grown its heap enough. Physical frame C is what contains the virtual addresses starting with zero and that's the code segment that we have in our virtual address space. So starting at C here, we've got sub, move, add, call, move, add, the same instructions that we have in that virtual address space. So this is just where we have happened to put that page in physical memory. Our program counter is pointing at the next instruction to execute, which is that move instruction. This is the thing that we are about to execute and we need to fetch it. So in order to fetch it, we have to go through the process of translating the virtual address into the physical address. With paging, we're doing kind of the same thing as segmentation, kind of the same thing as segmentation with explicit segmentation where we're looking at the prefix of the addresses to decide what value we should be using. The prefix of the addresses, so the address that we're trying to load here is 0x0004. And I'm gonna break this up into uh, I'm going to break this up into bits. I'm going to break this up into bits. So in bits, I'm going to write this 0B, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, actually 0, 1, 0, 0. So there's our binary representation of the address that we're about to try and translate. When we're figuring out how many bits are used for page numbers, we're looking at how big the virtual address space is divided by how many pages we want to have in that address space. The two bits at the beginning are what are going to be used for the page number in this address space. The two bits at the beginning are in the page number. The two bits at the beginning of the page number and what we're going to use from there is we're going to have to have our operating system change the page table base register ptbr the page table base register our page table itself we're going to say is in physical frame zero here so when our hardware, when our operating system is switching this process on, it sets this register and that's telling the MMU, the hardware, that when it's going to fetch addresses for the thing that happens to be running right now, it will start decoding addresses and it will have to go into physical memory to find this page table. So the hardware sees that this is the page number that we're trying to load. It's going to go to the page table base register in physical memory. So here, starting at zero, and it's going to find this translation. These page table entries have a fixed size. They're all going to be fixed in size, kind of like our directory entries and EXFAT are fixed in size. All the page table entries are fixed in size. So it's able to find an offset very quickly into the page table itself. It will find entry number zero and find that it is going to be in pay physical frame number C. Once we found that we're in physical frame number C, then we're going to go through the process of taking the rest of the address. So we've taken the first two bits off as the page number. The rest of the address here is now going to be the offset into the page. So here the first two bits are the page number. The rest of the bits are the offset. So our hardware goes and it fetches the page table. It finds the page table entry. 
Once it's found the page table entry, it sees that this virtual page is in physical frame number C. So we can go to physical frame number C here. And we've got the code segment in this. Once we've got that, then we can go through the process of taking the offset and adding it to the beginning of that physical frame number. So the translation is going to take physical frame number address and in, that, in this case that's 0xc and it's going to add to that the offset of the address. And the offset of the address that we're trying to load is everything that's left here. I mean, we got a bunch of zeros at the beginning. The offset of the address here is going to be 0x4. Sorry, this should be C000. So the, the beginning of that is going to be C000. The physical offset of uh, the offset of the address that we've got here is everything that's left after we've taken the page number off. We add those two things together, and what we're going to get here is a physical address of 0xc004. And that takes us to this move instruction in physical memory. Once we've gotten there, our CPU can load that from memory into itself and begin to decode the instruction and go through the process that it needs to go. So the main things that we're doing here are breaking apart our addresses, our virtual addresses, into a page number prefix and then an offset within the page in the physical page that we've got. We're using that offset. Once we found the page number that we're trying to load from, the physical frame number that we're trying to load from, we're adding that offset to the physical address of that frame. And then we're getting the actual address of the thing that we're trying to find. The length of the virtual address is kind of like both hardware and OS dependent. It's related to that page table entry size. And uh, there's like a multi hundred page book from Intel that describes what the architecture supports and it defines what the page table entries look like. And so the hardware, I guess the hardware is what dictates what the page size is or what the page sizes can be. Let me say it that way, what the page sizes can be. Yeah. Yeah. This is me just trying to be a little lazy when I'm writing. This should be 0x0004. It would be the same as what we've got here. Yeah. In, yeah, in this case, if we had more pages, so I've just separated this into four things. If we separated it into 16 pages, we'd have to use four bits. If I separated it into 32 pages, I'd have to use eight bits. Yeah, so kind of kind of like this answer, whatever Intel documentation says for the page table entry, if you've got a 64-bit processor, you've got 56 bits for virtual addresses, and this is how much, this is how you would set the page size that you're going to be using, uh, but it's gonna tell you that in the hardware textbook, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure the number is 56 bits for a 64 bit processor. Virtual addresses can be 56 bits. But I, I might, don't, don't quote me on that, but it's, it's something, it's not, it's not 64, but it's way more than two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any other questions about that? OK, good, good. Uh, so what I want to do here is um, start to do compare and contrast with uh, paging and segmentation. I printed out some questions for you. I'll put them up on the screen. Um, again, I like to have paper so that I can write stuff down on the paper. But it's just me kind of projecting onto you. 
I'm sorry that I've killed all these trees on your behalf this term. <laughs> it has been so smoky. Like the sun is just this orange disc in the sky, and I. And the other day it was like just through the day, like in the morning there was nothing. Yeah. Do you do you think it's cold because of the smoke? Like, is it blotting out the sun? <laughs> This is also up on the course webpage, so if you want to uh, to find it there, you got a new power cord. You stole your brother's. <laughs> it's new to you. It's new to you. That's that's all that's important. It's new to you. So what I want to do is just compare and contrast paging and segmentation here. And the way that I'm going to do this is just to give you a couple of like just just like 30 seconds per each half of this question. I'm going to read this initial part to you, but then once we get to this question part, I'll give you some time. Like I said, 30 seconds. I'm not asking for necessarily super precise values here. I'm just looking to get an idea of what we've got. So here is some code. We've got a PCB, we've got an operating system that's running this code that contains this program, and it's been set up already for doing translations, whether it's segments or paging. We've got registers for our segments, or we've got a linear page table. How many memory accesses are necessary for each of these things to complete a transaction? So I want you to answer this in two ways. The first way is just relatively. And I'm going to give you just like 10 or 15 seconds to think about this. Segmentation, so relatively means segmentation has fewer memory accesses to do the translation, or segmentation has more memory accesses to do the translation, just relatively. No precise values here. Take 10 seconds. OK, so fewer here, I'm going to say this is thumbs down, or more is thumbs up. What do you think? Segmentation has fewer memory accesses to do a translation, or more accesses to do a translation than linear paging? Less, yeah, less. Relatively less. Now I'm going to give you just 30 seconds to think about this. I'm looking for a number here. I'm looking for an actual number. How many memory accesses are necessary for each of these things to do a translation? The way that I'm going to ask you to show this to me is on a, a hand, like show of fingers. That means that five is kind of the max because I'm not going to make you take your shoes off. Five is the max. Five is the max. Take 30 seconds. Think about this. OK, segmentation, how many memory accesses does it take to do the translation? So here's what I'm seeing right now. This, and, and also this. <laughs> how many memory accesses does it take for segmentation to do a translation. The PCB has been set up for the translation. 
The operating system has done the context switch. To do the translation for segmentation, it takes this, this many, it takes this many, it takes zero memory accesses to do the translation. When we set the register, we set the segment registers, we set all those segment registers up, the memory management unit, the MMU, the CPU, the hardware, it's got everything it needs to do. It does not have to go to memory to find out what those things are. The, op the OS set those values when it's switched to that process. Linear paging, okay, do you need some more time to think about this or are you okay to give an answer right now? One person's nodding. I'll give you 10 more seconds. Take 10 more seconds to think about it. Let me talk about the process again. We, when we're doing a context switch with paging here, our operating system sets the page, page table base register. That's what it does. Then the, then the hardware has to take over. So how many accesses are necessary to do the translation? Take 10 seconds. Just take 10 seconds. Yeah. So just to do the translation. Okay, what do you think? Show of fingers. Okay, I see mostly one. I see mostly one, and I see one like, <laughs> like that. Okay, so to do the translation itself, our hardware has the page table base register, and it has the virtual address that it's trying to translate. To do just the translation, our hardware is going to access memory at the page table. So it's going to look for the page table base register, and then it's going to have to find the page table in memory. Once it's found the page table, it's loading that into TLB or, or something. It's loading it somewhere, and then it has enough to do the translation. It's got the page table entry, so then it can do the translation. It doesn't need to fetch anything to do the offset because the offset is just part of the virtual address. It's already part of the virtual address, so it doesn't have to fetch anything else. So to do the translation, segmentation has zero memory accesses. It still has to do the translation to fetch the instruction. With paging, we have to do a memory access to fetch the translation, then we can fetch the instruction. So one memory access. We okay with that? Okay, all right. The next question here is about how much memory is required. So the question that I'm asking here is really, in the PCB, in the process control block, how much do we have to keep track of for accomplishing segmentation? And how much do we have to keep track of for doing paging? Take 10 seconds. I'm going to do the same thing here again. I'm going to invert these less thumbs down or more thumbs up. Take 10 seconds. OK. So thumbs up means segmentation takes more memory. Thumbs down means segmentation takes less memory. I am so happy you still have that. <laughs> I'm going to interpret that as a thumbs down. Yeah. Segmentation relatively requires a lot less memory than paging. So let's answer the second question. Absolutely. Absolutely, and then approximately how much does it require? Because we don't know exactly how much it requires, but we can get a sense of approximately how many things it has. And I want you to be thinking about approximately in terms of registers and page table entries. Take 30 seconds to think about this one, how much segmentation requires. Let's just do segmentation. That's where we're stopping right now. We'll do paging after that. Take 30 seconds, just think about segmentation.
you will need two hands for this one. You're going to need two hands for this one. Okay. Segmentation, you should have a question for me before we even get to the answer. What's the unit? What's the unit? Well, the unit is registers. The unit's registers. Yeah. That's a good question, but what's the other question? Yeah. Yeah. So, so base and bounds could be one register. It can be as little as one register to just keep track of where it starts. If all of the physical addresses, all the physical chunks are segmented at the same size, so that's good. The question that I'm thinking about is how many segments are there? How many segments do we actually have? Do we have, do we have four or do we have two? I'm going to say we have four. I'm going to say we have four because that's all the pictures that we've ever seen have four. One for code, one for heap, one for stack, one for that thing in the middle that doesn't have a name. The reality is segments are two, two segments. So we have four segments. How many registers do we have to keep track of for those four segments? This is where you need two hands. We need eight. We need eight. We need two per segment. Unlike base and bounds, where we can say that all of them have the same size, segmentation is very explicitly, they can be different sizes. The allocation can be different sizes. So we have to keep track of explicitly, where does this start in physical memory? And what's the limit? How far can it go? Let's do 30 seconds more for paging. Unless there's any questions about segments. Yeah, yeah. We could just, yeah, we could, we could, in theory, optimize that away and say we're we're actually never going to allocate anything in that region, so we just won't have that. But it, again, it, in practice, we actually just have two segments instead of four, so we don't have that problem. Okay, so let's do paging. Take thirty seconds. How many page table entries do we have to keep track of? I'm going to give you a little hint. You cannot answer this absolutely. It's going to be relative to other things that you've got in this setup, relative to other things that you've got. So I'm going to add the word size of here. And I'm going to add this as a fraction. When we're thinking about how big the page table is, we're thinking about it in terms of a fraction of sizes of different things. All right, so what should the numerator be here? Any ideas? The size of virtual memory, the virtual address space. So this is the size of everything that we've got. If we have 64-bit virtual address space, this is our numerator. This is going to be how big of memory it is that we are going to be breaking into small chunks. What about the denominator then? What should the denominator be here? The page size. So this is going to be like how many bytes uh, each page size has. Yes. This is going to tell us how many pages there are, the size of our virtual address space divided by the size of a single page. That tells us how many pages we have in our virtual address space. If we're doing a linear page table, we have to have one page table entry per page. We've got to have one page table entry per page. 
It's okay with everybody? Okay. I'm gonna just, uh, I'm gonna delete this question. So we're not gonna look at this question. And I'm gonna just give you some verbal answers here. So in terms of segmentation, what responsibilities does an operating system have? With segmentation, our operating system has to keep track of what physical memory is free and what is allocated. It has to do things like move memory around potentially. So thinking back to your garbage collector, we gotta, we gotta move stuff around, we have to cup, cup, Press, that was not the right word. Compact, that was the word that was used in that garbage collector assignment. We have to compact memory. We have to defragment memory. The other things that an operating system has the responsibility of with segmentation is for each running process, it has to change the PCB. It's gotta have entries in the PCB for the segments for that process. For paging, it's similar. Our operating system still has to keep track of what's been allocated and what's not allocated. But with paging, we can do that with something like an allocation bitmap. We can just keep track of which pages have been allocated and which are not allocated. We don't have to spend time thinking about how much space there is in between things because we're just allocating pages. We still also have to keep track of, for each process, these are the translations. These are where you can find the physical frame numbers for these virtual page numbers. With both segmentation and paging, the hardware has the responsibility of doing things like the actual translation. That's the big thing. It actually does the translation given the information that the operating system is providing to it. The other thing that it has is the responsibility of verifying that the address that it's just translated is within the bounds of what has been allocated for a process. That leads back to what responsibility does the operating system have? And this is for both. It has the responsibility of handling those situations. Somebody's tried to access something that's out of bounds. Get someone to print the word segmentation fault. Send a signal to the process, the process terminates, the shell is waiting on it, the shell prints out segmentation fault. What responsibilities does a user program have in segmentation and paging? Nothing, nothing. Your user program doesn't know anything about virtual memory. It doesn't need to know anything about virtual memory. It doesn't need to do translations. It doesn't need to do anything. Yes, please. Can you access physical memory from a user process? No, you are not privileged enough to do that. To get to the point of being able to access physical memory, you have to do that mode switch. You have to switch into the OS side of things. Yeah. Okay, all right. So let's take a little whirlwind tour here through comparing paging and file systems. I'm going to do this by recapping paging and file systems. I'm going to summarize some topics Paging and file systems seem kind of different when you first look at them. They're at different levels of the memory hierarchy. We've got physical drives fairly low in the memory hierarchy and memory kind of in the middle but closer to the top of the memory hierarchy. And we're talking about persistent storage versus ephemeral or volatile storage. We're also talking about persistent storage that can potentially be passed around between machines. I can put an EXFAT file system on a USB drive and give it to you, and your computer will be able to read that EXFAT file system. I can't take main memory out of my system and plug it into your system and just have it work. It's not gonna happen. They're pretty different in terms of the medium that's on them. However, they are kind of similar, and I want to do a step through of each of these things, take a look at some figures, and start to thinking about what's in that proc file system for that memory mapping layout. 
here's a file system. This is VSFS. VSFS is an inode-based file system, and it is separated by blocks. Every unit that we've got here is a block. This is typically put on a drive that itself has this atomic unit of sectors. Sectors can be written or not written, but not partially written. A block consists of one or more sectors. Our file system has a super block. It has metadata about the file system itself. After the super block in VSFS, we have these two allocation structures, the inode bitmap and the data bitmap. The inode bitmap is used to indicate which inodes in the inode table have been allocated or not allocated. The data bitmap is a bitmap that is used to indicate which of the data region blocks have been allocated or not allocated. In our inode structure, we have metadata about files, and then within our data region, we have metadata about some files in the form of file names for directories. I'm going to zoom in here on the inode structure. And the inode structure has information like the mode of the file. This mode keyword here, this is the permissions of the file. So this is that RWX, RWX, RWX. Can this file be read, written, or executed by the user, by the group, by everybody that's on the system? It has information like the user ID of the accounts that created this file. It has information like this is how many bytes this file is in size. And then it has block pointers. Block pointers are going to be an array of values that are referring directly to the block or the data region of our file system. But more interestingly, it's got indirect block pointers. Indirect block pointers are a block pointer that points at a block. So this is referring to block eight in our file system. The entire block then is filled with more block pointers. So we've got direct block pointers. Here's the data for this file. Indirect block pointers are, here's a data block that is filled with pointers to the data for this file. We've got this level of indirection. Inodes can also have uh, doubly indirect and triply indirect block pointers kind of jumping around in this extremely unbalanced tree structure. Very narrow at the top and super big and wide on the one side. Here is paging in both of its forms. With paging, we've got a linear page table. In the pictures that I've been drawing, I've just been drawing this translation between page number and physical frame number. That's all that I've been doing. In reality, our pages have things like permissions. And the permissions that are attached to pages are, this is a read-only page, this is an execute page, this is a writable page. Our permissions there are going to have a kind of relevance to which part of our virtual address space layout we're looking at. We've got an allocation structure in our linear page table, but it doesn't quite look the same as what we had with file systems because it's kind of like spread across all these page table entries. We have an allocation structure that says this has been allocated or it has not been allocated. It's a valid bit. Our operating system, on the other half of this, not pictured in this diagram, has to keep track of which physical frame numbers have been allocated or not allocated. And it can do that with an allocation structure because they are all fixed in size. Multi-level page tables or page directories work approximately the same way as linear page tables. But the difference is we've got a physical frame here that contains entries to pages that themselves are filled with page table entries. 
So rather than putting all the page table entries directly in a page table, we have a very small page table that points at pages that themselves have the physical frame number translations. With this approach, we can do things like not allocate entire pages of translations or allocate entire pages of translations as necessary. Let's take a look at proc self maps again. Proc self maps has the virtual address space layout of our process. It has things like these are where the address ranges themselves are. It has permissions that are attached to it. It's got file names here, and we've got offsets into the file that are being read from the file into that address range. The permissions that we have here are for things like, I've got a code segment here for this program that's called less, and I want to be able to execute the instructions in it. I do not want to be able to write them. I do want to be able to read them to do that execution. So we've got permissions in our memory. How are they similar to each other? Take two minutes to pop this up on your screen, and let's see what we can find here. I'm going to put one minute on my timer. Shouldn't have put 10 options here, I'm sorry. 10 options was too many. Okay, I'll give you 30 more seconds. And it's obviously okay if you didn't get a chance to, to pop it up there. All right, so I like this. Fixed size chunks here is moving towards the top corner. It's both virtual memory paging specifically and file systems. Blocks are fixed in size. Sectors are fixed in size. We didn't really talk much about sectors being a fixed size thing, but they're definitely a fixed size thing. Clusters are fixed in size. Once we're trying to put stuff into something, it's a fixed size thing. Uh, allocation structures. They're both virtual memory and paging, and that's trending toward the top there, which is great. We have to keep track of which pages are free, and we have to keep track of which blocks are free. 
It's almost like blocks, clusters, and pages are the same idea. It's almost like they're the same idea. Hardware support. Hardware support is very much really only a virtual memory and paging thing. We can say, we could argue, you got to have a hard drive to put a file system on. We can make that argument, yeah, for sure. But, but I'm really thinking like in order to accomplish this at all, to do the virtual memory and paging, that's something that we're doing mainly in hardware. Internal fragmentation, this is something that both of them can suffer. So this could kind of move up a little bit more toward the corner here. We're minimizing this with those fixed size structures. We're really trying to minimize this with those fixed size structures. Files kind of definitely belongs more over to this side for file systems and, and more toward this side for not virtual memory and paging. This, I think, is still despite what we've got here with our terminal. Yes, these are files that are loaded into memory, but once they're in memory, we don't really actually care that they're files. We don't care that much that they're files. Permissions. Permissions are going to be true for both. So I'm glad that this is on the top of this VM and paging axis. It's definitely a lot more for file systems than it is for virtual memory and paging in that we have more things that we're applying permissions to, but virtual memory and paging itself does have some kind of permissions. We need to be able to execute pages because they have code in them. We only want them to be able to be readable because they have code in them. Uh, slowness here, I think that does fit firmly in the middle here. They're both kind of like the same amount of slow. The other thing that sticks out in my mind when I'm thinking about this is indirection. Indirection for file systems, we have these indirect block pointers with virtual memory and paging. When we go to that multi-level page structure, it's just the same idea, but in memory instead of in a file system. All right, so I'm aware of the time. Thank you for giving me a couple of extra minutes. Here's a quick summary. Virtual memory, base and bounds, was fine, that led us to segmentation, which was fine, but now we've got paging, which is a really good general purpose solution for implementing virtual memory. There are speed issues with this, and those are solved with caching that translation look aside buffer itself, but that's outside the scope of this course. The size issues that we've got are resolved with different data structures. So this multi-level page table as opposed to a linear page table. File systems and paging are really similar to each other. When you squint at them, they've got the same kinds of ideas. They have the same kinds of ideas. They're solving the same kinds of problems, especially surrounding things like indirection and uh, fragmentation.